Um, this is Rocklands University, first uh, Rockland U, first uh, webinar in a, what will hopefully be a series of webinars. And today we're going to be covering the Veriflow polymer dispensing machine. Uh, Rockland, we are the makers of a line of concrete asphalt repair products that are polymer based. Uh, we're going to cover, as I say, tips, tricks and benefits of the Veriflow machine. That's what we'll focus and uh, look at the benefits over conventional repair materials. Uh, we'll start off here with uh, the latest addition to the line of polymer dispensers. This is our 10 gallon machine and this is favored by companies who do uh, small utility cuts or uh, warehouse floors where um, they need a more portable unit than the larger units that we have. Um, so this is something that we've been uh, developing over the last number of months. It is identical to the uh, larger machines with the exception of obviously the uh, containers are a lot smaller so you can go with 10 gallons but it does have a compressor on there as you can see here's the compressor down here we've got the control box we've got the dispensing unit manifold control valves A side and B side pumps with the motors uh, this is the 100 gallon machine. Um, as you can see, we've got a larger bay there for the uh, 55 gallon drums. Um, we do not have any wheels on this uh, version of the machine because if you have two 55 gallon drums full of material, you're talking 1,000 pounds, plus the weight of the machine itself is about 275. So you're talking 1275 and it's not going to be as mobile as some of the other machines. Uh, here we have the 15 or the 515, and named so because it can handle both a 10 gallon kit, an A side of A side 5, B side 5, or a 30 gallon kit. Uh, it's much more portable because the overall weight is 300 pounds of product plus 275 for the machine, so you're looking at 575. Uh, this is favored uh, where you need a little bit more mobility. The larger machine can be placed on the back of a pickup or on a flatbed or on a trailer. This machine here uh, is more flexible, or I'm sorry, is more maneuverable because of its weight. It's got coasters, um, so you can pull it along. This is the handle, and it can move quite easily. Uh, we've got the B side and A side. Again, it's the same uh, setup as the other two machines. Uh, we've got a toolbox up here, and that you can carry your extra static mixers, your extra manifold, your extra motor, some tubes, some tools, anything you need to keep yourself in business while you're out there in the field. Uh, as you can see, we have the new dispensing unit here, uh, which we recently developed and introduced last year. And uh, Basically, the A and the B side are going to be drawn by this pump here down the tube into the motor, push down the hose all the way through. This is a backflow control joint so the material doesn't black flow. These are the valves into the manifold and then out the static mixer. And that's standard procedure for all of these uh, types of machines. I think that's about it for the machine. And we can, we can return back to the machine if you have any questions. This is the uh, new gun that we were talking about. Uh, as you can see, we converted a Black & Decker cordless drill. Uh, we had a local electrical engineer work on it for us. And we looked into the research and development of developing a brand new gun and it was like reinventing the wheel. So we went with something that we were able to use the um, electrics and some of the mechanics and obviously the housing on and we were able to provide this type of unit far more uh, cost effectively. And This was done based on a lot of requests that we were getting from Caltrans where they wanted more control and uh, to be able to direct the flow of material at the static mixer. Um, a lot more accurately. So what we found was by doing this and having a more ergonomical trigger, um, we were able to place the material up a lot more accurately. Plus it looks cooler. So concrete welder. Concrete welder is a two component polyurethane system designed to support heavy tra traffic loads. This material was originally designed as a rapid runway repair material for the military. So it, it was designed to land the plane on. This is pretty st tough stuff. It's flexible enough, however, to minimize bond stresses and thermal stresses. So in a thermal contraction and expansion cycle, it does particularly well. It also does well in load transfer and 
uh, load, if it's got really good load diffusion properties, and that will help with uh, load transfer and hopefully promote a longer lasting repair. Uh, the low viscosity of the material ensures deep penetration to can counter hydraulic pumping action. At the base of the repair where there's generally failure, um, if water can flow there, this material has low enough viscosity that it should be able to flow down there too. So we get really good penetration. Uh, we've taken some core samples where, where we've gotten a full 10 to 12 inches all the way through some pretty thin cracks and we're able to fill those voids and uh, restore the structure of the base of the slab without disturbing the base and that enables us to uh, again elongate the life expectancy of the slab. Now it's rapid setting for quick return to traffic. This particular formulation that we're working with right now it's got a two minute cure time. So at an ambient temperature of 72 degrees it should set up in two to three minutes with um, a full complement of sand and rock that acts as, it's an exotherm reaction, so that acts, acts as a heat sink and draws some of that energy out, so it may delay it. Uh, cooler temperatures will also delay it, but on average, even with particularly cold temperatures, we should get a cure time of no more than 10 to 12 minutes. <clears throat> so, uh, in order to extend the life expectancy of the concrete, we've got to fill those voids, and the penetration of the low viscosity material allows us to get down on in there. It also restores the aggregate intellect for interlock for better load transfer between the slab and the surrounding slabs and that, and it, that slab stabilization will allow for the traffic as it's coming over the approaching slab, the compromised slab and then the departing slab. It makes for a smooth transition and that in itself will elongate the life expectancy of the repair. So. Uh, seals from both beneath the slab to protect from groundwater protection, penetration rather. By that, what we mean is if you do a rubberized crack sealer on your cracks at the surface, that will do well in preventing moisture uh, penetration from the surface. However, groundwater coming up from beneath or groundwater or water entering adjacent slabs that have not been sealed, the water will work its way under there and it will cause hydraulic pumping where the weight of the traffic compresses the concrete, pushes on the concrete, pushes out the fines, creates a larger void. If you don't fill those voids, those concrete slabs will break down at the surface. This material, by virtue of its low viscosity, can travel all the way down. It's got a very quick setup point, so it creates a backfill point, stabilizes, fills those voids, and now you can build that slab back up again to grade. So topical application allows for grade restoration with no demolition or removal of material. A lot of times what we see out there is a big chunk of concrete slab has broken and it is being compressed. On average, 100 to 150,000 vehicles a day are going to hit that slab. They're going to drive it further down, so you'll see a drop of two to three inches. With that level of compaction, our approach is to not excavate and remove that slab but rather use that heavily compacted piece of concrete, weld it back together again with the surrounding slab, and then build upon it so that two or three inch drop, we're going to flood it with uh, aggregate, we're going to flood it with polymer, then we're going to top it with sand, and now we've restored it back up to grade. And it's similar to what we would do if we were diamond grinding. You know, diamond grinding is done on, on lanes so that you get a good load transfer from slab to slab to slab. This material incidentally can also be down in ground. So if you do get it above grade, you can easily bring it back down to grade. So the one-to-one -one ratio of application insurance consistent mix every time. There are other products out there that are not a one-to-one -one ratio. So when they go off ratio, if the A side, for instance, on a four-to-one product, on the A side, which is 20% by volume of the entire mix, if that goes off 1%, then your B side goes off 4%. If it goes off 2%, then your B side goes off as much as 8%. And you will have difficulty getting a solid cure. This material, because it's one to one, can go 52, 48. It can go 53, 47. It has even gone 45, 55. Now, it does take a little while longer to cure, but you will get that full cure eventually. So that's one of the advantages of going with a one to one. 
the uh, machine, as we uh, highlighted earlier, we've made it very simple. Uh, earlier versions of the machine had a lot of bells and whistles, had a lot of things that they could do. We removed all of those. It's a simple delivery system. So if there is a clog or a breakdown with the uh, swivel joints that we have on and the quick release uh, pumps that we have on, we can get up and running relatively quickly and we don't, in, if you're in a closure and you have a breakdown, we should be able to get it up and running on average between 5, 10, 15 minutes and certainly no longer. Now with minimal prep and no demolition or removal significantly reduces labor requirements. This can be done with a three-man crew and because we're not saw cutting or jackhammering out any of the material, we can get to place the material within five or ten minutes of getting on site. There's no major prep work required. Uh, actually on the video that we're going to show later you will see a saw cut in there. That's not to say you can saw cut. In this particular job, uh, saw, cu it, saw cutting is a requirement so um, you will see a saw cut in this video but that is not always necessary though obviously the more time you spend on prep the uh, better the results. So reduced repair times allow for faster return to traffic with minimal interruption and safer work environment. <clears throat> and I think that speaks for itself. The quicker you can get in and out of there, the less likely you are to have workers exposed to, in some cases, 65 mile an hour traffic. Or in the case of the LAX video that we're going to look at later, uh, 747 is going overhead very closely. So this is the northbound 5, just south of Lebec. We have a series of 12 concrete slabs that have been compromised and what we're going to do today is show you how we uh, flooded these areas with polymer and aggregate, restored it to grade. The closure went in at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, a two-man crew got into the closure at 9.30. Uh, we were able to restore 12 slabs and uh, we pulled out of the closure at just after 11.30 and returned it to traffic by 11.45. Uh, for a total cost of materials of less than $4,000. So the process, what we do first is we blow out any loose debris via uh, compressed air or a leaf blower. We want to inspect it for moisture. If there is moisture present, we'll hit it with a propane, propane torch to dry it off. The cleaner and drier the surface is, the better the bond we're going to get with this polymer. Obviously, if the moisture doesn't present itself, if there is moisture down at the base, it will interact with the moisture. The ISO A side reacts with the H2O to create CO2, carbon dioxide gas. That carbon dioxide gas is lighter, so it wants to expand the polymerization process and expel or escape at the surface. So it will, in effect, wick away the water at the interface and expel it at the surface. Uh, once we do that, we'll see some rising, some yeast-like phenomenon. We can just cut it off, shave it off, and then apply more polymer. So <clears throat> once we've expected for moisture, we burn it off, get a better bond. Primer is not required for this material because the porosity of the aggregate, that's the aggregate's ability, the concrete's ability to absorb this material allows for a better bond. So the material we have penetrates into the concrete and gets a really good bond without the requirement of primer. So <clears throat> primer is not required as the porosity of the aggregate dictates the strength of the bond. Concrete welder is designed to be adsorbed into the concrete. Adsorbed meaning it becomes one with the concrete. And its absorption, that's the penetration, allows it to act as its own primer. So here we are, we're removing any loose debris from a typical repair. As you can see, we've got some broken slab. Some, uh, we'll take all of that out. And now we're going to start the Veriflow machine. We want to check that we have a consistent flow of polymer from the manifold head. We're then going to attach the static mixer and hand tighten the retaining nut. Then we're going to place the static mixer excuse me, into a small bucket, run the machine briefly just to make sure that we've got a good flow and we've got the A side and the B side mixing in ratio. 
this is what a typical manifold shot, this is a screen capture. As you can see, we've got good flow on the A side, good flow on the B side. This was actually an asphalt version, so it's pigmented black, but for concrete, we'd have it pigmented gray. So now we're going to place the static mixer nozzle into the crack and engage the motor. We're going to pump it out <clears throat> anywhere from a gallon a minute to three gallons a minute. We want the material, the low viscosity material to flow freely to the base of the repair. Once it's there, the two minute reactivity will react, create a backfill point and hopefully fill the bulk, if not all of the voids that are under there. As you can see in this shot, the material has percolated to the surface and by presenting itself at the surface, we know that the material um, has filled the voids. <clears throat> so when it presents itself at the surface, we know that the voids are filled. At this point, we wait to see if the polymer will dissipate. If it does, then we introduce more polymer until the flow stops. We are now able to restore structure where it was absent in a sunken slab by pre-placing aggregate to just below grade. Remember, by only restoring structure where it's absent, we are cutting down on the volume of material re required. We were taking that compromised concrete slab, that broken slab, and instead of removing it and creating a look much larger volume of material required, by utilizing that compacted concrete cuts down on the volume. And, and that's what we're doing right here. This is a 3 8 inch aggregate. Uh, this particular slab had dropped, that corner break had dropped about 3 or 4 inches. So we were able to flood it with polymer, pre-place the aggregate, and now we're going to flood it with polymer again to get it up to repair. So by utilizing, utilizing the heavily compacted damaged concrete, we eliminated the need for removal and replacement, ensuring a fast repair. We tend to favor 3 8 inch, inch pea gravel with a 16 mesh sand. A larger aggregate, like a 3 quarter inch crushed or a 1 inch crushed aggregate, will create a larger void volume, so you'll use more polymer than you will aggregate. At uh, below, like a quarter inch aggregate, creates too small a volume, so the polymer doesn't penetrate as well, and you'll have more uh, aggregate than you will polymer. So we found the optimum is a 3 8 inch. These aggregates can be locally sourced as long as they're clean and dry. And here we are, once we've established grade, we're now flooding that area with polymer. And <clears throat> so we're flooding the pre-placed aggregate with polymer. Now we're going to start broadcasting sand, the topping sand to refusal. And then we're going to check for low spots, low spots and apply more polymer if needed. And as you can see here, we're uh, throwing in the sand. Uh, obviously, if it was left without any topping sand, we would have too slick a surface. So the topping sand fills the voids, but it also creates a nice surface in terms of traction. And then once we do that, <clears throat> because of the fast cure time, we can open it up to traffic. And in doing so, this material here, as you can see, we, we, we blow off the sand and then pull the cones. And this whole process in this particular uh, application took two hours. Of the 12 slabs, three years later, 11 were uh, still intact and we had breakdown of one of them. So we had one of them, uh, it failed. The failure was not catastrophic insofar as it still held together. We just did, did lose a small volume of material in the center. Um, that particular repair, they knew that it was going to be replaced in a matter of years. They had a full depth reclamation project going through there, so um, it lasted three years. It cut down on sig significantly on repeat visits. Um, cold mix, obviously, it was too far gone. Hot mix, limited life expectancy, six months to a year. We were able to provide that particular application in three years, and then they ripped it out, put in new slabs, and it performed quite well. So the benefits of the process. Uh, Minimum prep reduces labor costs significantly. Your largest cost component in any repair is always going to be labor. Your smallest or one of the smallest cost components is actually the material that we put in the ground. So by reducing our, uh, by reducing our labor costs, 
we're able to make a far more cost-effective repair. I just had a question from John Holmes, which I'll address right now. Does the shape of the aggregate have any condition on the final repair? Um, shape as in a naturally rounded aggregate versus a coarser aggregate or an angular rock. Uh, the angular rock tends to sit and uh, can handle the compression better. Uh, naturally rounded rock makes for a more flexible repair because if you can picture a number of ba um, ball bearings uh, that are flooded with liquid, there's like pivot points within that. So the shape of the aggregate uh, will dictate what kind of repair you get, only to a small degree. The naturally rounded aggregate will give you a um, slightly more flexible repair, an angular rock because of the way the angular rock sits on top of itself uh, will give you a more rigid repair. I hope that answers your question, John, but we can touch upon that a little bit later if we have it. So uh, re the benefits, minimum prep, repair time is counted in minutes, not hours. The quick set allows for quicker return to traffic. The flexibility enables longer lasting repairs, especially in the thermal contraction and expansion cycle. Uh, safe to use, no VOCs and closed delivery system eliminates exposure concerns. One of the problems that we've always had with uh, using a polymeric uh, repair is that the acide isocyanate, um, some people if they handle a lot can develop some sensitivity to it in the form of a dermatitis or a rash. So you want to always wear protective clothing, long sleeves, gloves and uh, whatnot. Uh, in terms of once the material is delivered at the end of the static mixer, it's combined with the A side and the B side to create a material that's inert, meaning that any of the issues that you have with the A side have now become muted or significantly reduced. Uh, A side isocyanate over the counter known as Gorilla Glue. So this material that we have uh, that makes up the A side is available over the counter, but it's certainly by eliminating its exposure and by ke keeping the system uh, fully enclosed, it will eliminate some of those concerns. And uh, seals and waterproofs concrete from above and below the, the slab. Imagine being able to seal a slab from underneath without, being able, without having to remove that slab. That is a great benefit of this material. So it should, if it's installed properly and everything being equal, last longer than conventional repair materials because of the coefficient of expansion. As the surrounding materials expand at a different rate, this material can absorb that expansion. As the surrounding materials contract, this material has elasticity. So with its pretty good bond, it can stay in shape. Uh, it can be applied over a wide temperature range. The coldest we've done it is at um, 8,000 feet at Donner Pass on I-80 uh, outside Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, in February or March where temperatures were pretty cold. The uh, hottest we've done it is in Las Vegas. One day we put it down at an installation in Las Vegas and it was 101 degrees. Uh, the finished product has good chemical resistance to oils, hydraulic fluids, diesels and gasoline. Uh, the grade restoration enhances smooth ride, so that's why we diamond grind these lanes is that we want good load transfer and by diamond grinding it's supposed to extend the life expectancy of the pavement by five years or in some cases even longer. By restoring the grade with this material we're able to do that. Effective <coughs> enables effective load transfer from approaching slab through the repaired slab and then onto the departing slab and as we've established because you can get in and out relatively quickly because the volume of and that reduces your labor costs because the volume of material that's used is relatively low this can be a cost effective repair especially as we get into longer lasting repairs. Um, we're always asked what kind of guarantee do we give. I'd like to say we guarantee that this material will fail as will all repair materials. However, we have had repairs on the southbound 5 uh, outside Camp Pendleton at the Lost Polgas exit that have been down for seven and a half years and they're still intact and they're holding up well. Uh, if we got a year out of the repair on a heavily trafficked 150 to 200,000 vehicles a day, uh, I'd say we did okay. If I got two years, I'd say we did better. If I got three years, I'd be happy. 
If I got four years, I thought, well, maybe we're not charging enough money for this. And if I got five years, I think we're definitely not charging enough money. Uh, we had repairs that have failed after a year and a half to two years. But anything prior to that, whether it be cold mix, may have lasted a couple of weeks. Hot mix may have lasted a couple of months. So we should always be a multiple of conventional repair materials. And when you amortize the cost of that repair over the life expectancy of the repair, with the reduced labor costs and the smaller crews and the less demolition and removal and no requirement of heavy compact material, it will become cost effective. So, uh, a couple of tricks of the trade before we jump onto the video real quick. Um, always carry a replacement manifold. If a blockage does occur, it's nearly always with the A side. And you can, with the uh, implementi implementation of uh, swivel joints, you can get in and out in five to ten minutes. When a barrel is running low, place a two by four under the end of the barrel, tip it forward so we get no pockets of air in the hoses. Uh, when storing for a long period of time, drain the A side only and replace with vegetable oil. Uh, the B side has a consistency of motor oil, so it doesn't uh, crystallize like the A side does. Uh, when storing the gun overnight, always have the manifold pointing down. This will prevent any potential backflow. So the material that's in there will flow out and it shouldn't seize it up. When filling a saw coat repair, coat the walls and base of the repair prior to placing aggregate. This will ensure a good bond. When, removing from, when moving from a repair site to repair site, let a constant small flow of air stream through the static mixer. This will prevent setup and require fewer static mixers per repair. The compressor that's included in the, each machine is only there to purge the line. It doesn't drive anything. It doesn't do anything other than purge the line. That's why we set the airflow at a low 20 to 30 PSI. We want a small volume of, volume of air to purge the static mixer so it doesn't set up. When you're using in cold temperatures, try and store the material indoors overnight. That way. Um, it maintains its re reactivity because the core temperature of the material doesn't uh, go down. If applying in cold weather, you can cover the drums with an electric blanket. This too will help maintain reactivity. So if you're working in cold climates, you'd be well advised to try and maintain the core temperature of the material. So the first video I want to share with you today is at LAX. So let me just get in here. Excuse me a second. Bear with me. All right. So um, this is a repair that we did at LAX a number of months ago. Uh, the repair material that's in there. I'll just turn down the volume a little bit. Uh, the re repair material in there had actually failed, so that's why it was socket as it is. All we're going to do is blow out any loose debris. Uh, we've obviously excavated the failed material. I think that's flight 17 to Dallas or something. Anyway, we're on a taxiway here at LAX, so we're blowing out any loose debris with the use of a uh, leaf blower. You can use compressed air or a leaf blower. And we're going to scoot it along here. We're still blowing out. And now, you can see the propane torch there. What we've done is we've burned off any excess moisture. We want to make sure that the uh, area that we're going into is clean and dry. So now we're going to start coating the area and pre-placing the aggregate. And what that allows us to do is uh, get a good penetration of the material, and there it is. So we, as you can see here, we've painted or coated the, the uh, saw cut with the polymer. We're filling a, a little spot here. Now we've taken this 3 8 inch. This is a 3 8 inch polymer coated uh, pea gravel. If the pea gravel that you're using, the 3 8 inch pea gravel, is polymer coated, um, it's an extra step that we take because we don't want to deal with failures or issues of moisture out in the field. Um, if you have a local source for pea gravel, then uh, as long as it's clean and dry, it's a good product to use. If it is any potential moisture, again, you can hit it with a propane torch 
because you don't want the polymer, the iso A side, reacting with the H2O to create CO2. You will get some foaming. Now, when it does happen, it's not the worst thing that ever happened. If it is above grade, you can hit it with an angle grinder, bring it back down to grade. Um, if it does present itself in the form of, of um, a foam-like uh, phenomenon, you can let it cure and grind it off, or if it's still soft, you can grind it off. If, if there is any area that you can get more polymer in there, you can go ahead and get more polymer in there. So we've, in this particular video, we've gotten it nice and flush. We're taking off the excess aggregate, and now we're preparing to flood the material, and that's what we're doing right there. As you can see, this is the uh, gray polymer, gray concrete welder. Uh, which is a recent development. We were able to find a lower viscosity pigment, uh, which may allowed us to maintain a low viscosity so we get the deep penetration. But now we have the benefit of uh, the pigment, which for aesthetic purposes, obviously, it's going to look better. We've also gotten away from our polymer-coated topping sand and gone with a local source here in uh, Ventura County topping sand that we're able to use. A, it's a Megilla brand, I think it's called. It's a number 16 silver sand, and from an aesthetic standpoint, that allows us to have a more concrete-like finish on the repairs. Uh, right now, we're trailing the polymer. We want to get it nice and flush with the surrounding pavement. Uh, we can either trowel it, or in some cases, we'll use a rake or uh, a cutter or um, a scraper. As you can see, we're flooding it. We want to make sure that we get good penetration. Again, the 3 8 inch um, aggregate that we use creates the optimum void volume. A larger aggregate, and you'd be using more polymer, and you wouldn't have the cost effectiveness that we like to achieve. We like to get our aggregates in at a 3 to 1 ratio. That allows it for good load bearing ability, um, also more cost effective, and a higher PSI rating so it can carry more of a load. Uh, if you go with a polymer-only version, uh, that's good in an area where you want to have uh, more flexibility. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> on this straight edge that we have where he's trailing right now, with a conventional repair material, you may have to go in and saw cut in and put a control joint. But because this material has a high degree of flexibility, it is, in effect, acting as its own control joint. And as such, you don't have to go back in. Once we're finished with this material, once we're finished with this application, we don't have to go in and soccer. So now we're just going to uh, throw some more topping sand on it. And there we have it. Um, total time for this repair from start to finish, there's another flight taking off was probably 12 to 15 minutes. Obviously, I'm trying to do a condensed version. Uh, the topping sand is the last application. It was particularly cold at LAX that morning, so we were probably talking uh, temperature-wise. I think when we started, it was in the high 30s. At this particular application, it was closer to the low 40s. So we had about, after the final pass of polymer, we had a probably a 15-minute wait until that was fully cured, but certainly not in the hours. Uh, Charles Skinner wants to know, how do I get certified to do these repairs? Um, the process itself is pretty simple. And a couple of training classes from Rockland, and introduction to the machine. We have a number of DVDs that we send out. And uh, you can follow those, or we can come out and train your forces uh, to do it. Um, it's, it's a simple process. The machine is simple. The application is simple. What we want to do is we want to give you, the end user, the ability to do these repairs without having to bring in contractors. For contractors, if you want to do it yourself, you now have the ability to do these repairs when contracted at hopefully a fraction of the cost of conventional repairs, but more importantly, in a fraction of the time. Uh, Tim Massout wants to know, is this water-based? No, it is definitely not water-based. It's a two component system, an A-side isocyanate, a B-side polyurethane. Uh, water is the enemy here. Water will compromise the polymerization process. Now, this material has some reactivity to moisture, and uh, if it didn't, the moisture, for instance, if we were pumping this material down into an area that had a lot of water, 
and it didn't react with the water, it would sit there. The water would create a barrier between the concrete that we want to adhere to, so you'd have concrete, water, and then polymer. But by having it reactive and so reactive to the water, it reacts with the water, it still allows the penetration into the concrete so you get a good bond. You don't get as good a bond, the bond is compromised, and you don't get the higher PSI rating that you need when water is introduced. But if you consider that the foam injection that they use, uh, let me mention Eurotech for example, Eurotech's foam when they're raising that slab, that has a PSI rating of like 8 or 9, it's pretty low. Uh, this material, without the introduction of water, um, would probably have, with a full complement of sand and rock, would have a PSI rating of about 4,800. Compromised, it would still have a PSI rating in the 26 to 2,800 range. So it's still able to um, carry that load, to interact with the surrounding pavement, and still do its job, so the compromised polymerization process isn't always necessarily a bad thing, because it has taken that liquid that water and expelled it at the surface in the form of carbon dioxide. Um, these materials were originally developed, concrete welder was developed, because Flexet, which was the original material that we used, I'm going to jump now to another repair real quick. Let's go north down 23. There we go. Um, before I finish, before I talk about this video, let me finish. I know we're running late, so if you have to get off, by all means, thanks for taking the time to listen to us. I'm going to continue on for a few minutes until they drag me kicking and screaming from this microphone. Uh, very briefly, uh, Flexet, which is our bucket re uh, repair material, um, on certain applications, as a topical application that worked particularly well if there was no voids underneath or if there was no substrate damage. What we found was where there was significant voids and significant substrate damage, unless we addressed those issues, unless we got something in there, we had a high, higher than acceptable failure rate. Uh, working closely with a Caltrans uh, supervisor, he explained to us what we really need to do is come up with a low viscosity material that would penetrate the slab, get all the way down to the base, fill those voids, and now we can topically apply our flex slab and we'd have a much higher success rate. And that's what we did. However, we then, in the next generation of concrete welder, decided that we didn't need to go with the flex set, that we could actually have a one-stop shop. We could penetrate the material all the way down to the base, liquid only because of its low viscosity, and then when we got to the surface, we could add the sand and the rock to give it structure and to restore structure where it's absent, yet still have a fairly flexible repair material that would counteract any movement that, we, that the uh, slabs still were experiencing. This is the northbound 23 in Moore Park. As you can see, we've got three slabs here that are significantly compromised. Uh, as you can see, they've used rubberized crack sealer, and it hasn't held up. What we're going to do today is we're going to flood these cracks with polymer, and then we've got about a three or four inch base that we're going to flood with aggregate to restore braid. Do you have another question there? Uh, Tim wants to know what kind of cert would be required. Um, I'll have to look into that. So what we'll do is we will uh, address that issue offline when I have the answers. Uh, remember, there is, as part of the uh, webinar today, there's a 15% coupon. So if you go to order material, uh, by using that coupon, you'll get 15% off. Uh, I'm going to try and speed through this, uh, what's going on right here. Uh, this is a northbound 23 in Ventura County. As you can see, we've already, we're have already using the wand to place the material into the uh, compromised slab. It's traveling all the way down to the base. It's reacting, creating a backfill point, and then we're putting sand and rock in it to provide structure. Here we are flooding the material all the way down, and we're moving along. As you can see, that drop is about three inches, which we're going to full, fill with aggregate in a few minutes. Uh, we've moved now down to the third slab material. 
has presented at the surface so that we know because of the flow viscosity, we know it's gone all the way down to where it needs to go. If water can get there, this material should be able to get there with rare exception. Uh, as you can see, that particular crack where the uh, nozzle is going in right now, it's about three or four inches in width. If you were to use a rubberized crack sealer with that, it would seal the surface temporarily, but it just doesn't have the structure to bond or support the load of the traffic. And here we are, as we're moving along, uh, we're getting sand into that crack in addition to getting the polymer in there because we want to have a good load bearing ability. And then we're tossing some sand there. Now, let me just back up a little bit, see where we placed in. Okay, so now, okay, so here we are. We've put approximately a thousand pounds of aggregate in there, and that's going to enable us to restore structure where it's absent, and allowed for a smooth transition from the approach slab, which is still intact, over the compromise slab, and also for lane transfer, the adjacent slab. So now we're pulling the aggregate, we're screening the aggregate, so that we get it nice and flush. Uh, right behind you there, you can see we are now, after we've placed the aggregate, we're putting in the uh, polymer, and we're sanding right behind because the ambient temperature in this particular application was about 64 to 65 degrees. Our cure time was running about four or five minutes. You don't want to wait too long before you get the sand in there because you'll end up with a slick surface. So we've got a couple of people moving behind. This was actually a training session for Caltrans, so we've got an, a lot of extra bodies standing around uh, watching the process or getting trained on the machine. Uh, typically, if I was doing that without a training session, you would have three people. One, one running the wand, one sanding, and one supplying rock and sand to the person who's distributing the sand. So as you can see, as we're moving along, we're getting the sand on very quickly. Here is another look at the repair. We've got a nice rhythm going at this point. Moving down the slab, getting the sand on. And this is coming to the end of the first pass. Let me back up a second. So here we are at the end. We're making sure that we can feather it into the existing so we have a nice ride. Uh, if we were to create a drop or if there was a drop there, that constant dropping of especially truck traffic would create a jackhammering hammering effect which would cause reverberation through uh, the compromised slab and expedite the breakdown of that slab. But by having this material be nice and flush, we facilitate a smooth load transfer and um, as you can see we're, we're sanding and we're screeding as we go. This is what it looks like before the final pass. Uh, we've restored structure. As you can see along this edge here, we don't require to put in a control joint because the flexibility of the material allows for it to act as its own control joint. And we're sanding. Sanding is very important. You want a high tractionable surface, uh, non-skid. And by putting in this coarse 16 mesh aggregate, it allows for that. Here it is before our final pass of polymer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that is our final pass of polymer, final pass of sand. And this is what the finished repair will look like. Uh, that closure went in at uh, 9 o'clock. The crew got into the closure about 9.30, 9.45. Um, we closed two lanes, so we had one functioning lane. Uh, we finished at mm, just before 11 o'clock, so we had about an hour and a half in the closure. We were able to restore those three slabs. Total cost of materials used, about $1,800. If this was not a training session, but an actual repair, I would expect a crew of three to be able to handle it. Total labor cost for the two hours, a couple of hundred dollars. So overall, for about $2,000, we restored three slabs. Life expectancy on a repair like this, anywhere from two 
to five years. Uh, in the absence of this repair material, Caltrans has a responsibility, obviously, to go out and do these repairs. If they're using cold mix, a couple of days, a couple of weeks. If they're using hot mix, six months to a year. Uh, but then, obviously, you'd have to do significant uh, prep and heavy compacting equipment. But we were able to get in and out relatively quickly. And uh, again, not a permanent repair, but a very long-lasting, long-term approach to concrete repair. Uh, Tim wants to know if this would bond to asphalt. Absolutely. It bonds to asphalt, concrete, wood, metal. The only thing it won't bond to is polypropylene or plastic. Um, it will separate or delaminate from that. That's why if you're doing these repairs and lifts, you want to make sure you get a good aggregate sanding on the surface between lifts so that the corresponding second lift has something to adhere to. If you were to put um, pore polymer onto a polymer only repair, it definitely would delaminate. Um, this material works particularly well for manhole abutment because it sticks very well to the metal. Um, it also does particularly well to asphalt where the asphalt and the concrete meet is always a potential failure plane because once the concrete, uh, once the seal on the asphalt is broken, it can open up and unravel. But uh, this material does particularly well in that. Um, I have one more video, but we're not going to get to it, unfortunately. We don't have enough time. But as I said, this uh, webinar is available. Uh, we did record it. I appreciate uh, your efforts and your time. Uh, if we have any questions, by all means, if we didn't get to it, uh, shoot us off an email and we'll get it to you. Um, if this webinar is as successful as I seem to think it went, I think it went pretty well today. We'll definitely run more and uh, we'll have different types of applications. Uh, the bucket mix, for example, we can do a subject on that. Uh, the smaller kits that we also uh, manufacture and sell and distribute. Uh, we can also do asphalt repairs, we can do manhole abutment, we can do uh, a number of different repairs and hopefully that will be subjects for our next webinar. So I want to thank each and every one of you for your time and for your patience. As I say, this is our first attempt at something like this, so uh, I appreciate your patience. Thanks and have a great day.